the sort of dynamic of the group was that there were certain people who wanted to get away early and certain people who were quite happy to, to talk on uh, till the cars came home. John was usually the one who wanted to get away early. He always had something to do. So John would tend to um, impose a certain pattern on the day, but this by no means held at all. And the best sort of Python days, when the best work was done, um, everybody would be sparking and, and it would be a truly democratic group. Um, but I think there were sort of, I would say there were probably two poles in the group. <laughs> there was Ladislav uh, Klees and, uh, no, there was John uh, uh, at one end and, and Terry Jones at the other. Um, I think John representing the cerebral and Terry the emotional. The main thing is that it was a group of people doing exactly what they wanted to do. It wasn't watered down by committees of executives getting together and decide what the public wants or doesn't want. It wasn't market research to say these are the people out there that we should be aiming for. It was none of that. It was six people saying, it makes us laugh, in it goes. And it's good and bad. It's uneven. The stuff, some of it works, some of it doesn't, but it doesn't matter. It has, it's, it's, you know, there's a voice there that you can actually hear. Most things are such, are so homogenized and, and depleted by all of the committee meetings that go on. And I think that's one of the reasons it, it stays alive. Now back to Monty Python here at Comedy Central. Hiya, folks. I'm Mark Marin, and it's 1995. Woo! Happy New Year to all of you. We're into our Monty Pythonathon. I want to take a moment to celebrate a time honored Python tradition, which, of course, is dressing in drag. The members of Monty Python had a nickname for their women characters, they were called Pepper Pots. See, what happened, Graham Chapman cracked that he and his mates looked like pepper mills when dressed in drag, and the name just stuck. So uh, I'd like to say that my two favorite pepper pots were Mrs. Premise and Mrs. Conclusion. They're housewives who go in search of the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre. But here's a look at some drag characters who have more in common with the Hell's Granny sketch. It's some fleet of foot Queen Victorians. In the what a odd sketch that is. Terry Jones said his favorite females to play were middle-aged suburban housewives. Terry also said that Eric Idle was the best at playing young and attractive women, although personally I think Carol Cleveland and Connie Booth, the real women who appeared on the show, did a little more for me, personally. Uh, we've got to do a couple of messages and we'll be back with another classic episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus. <laughs> There wasn't really a boss, and we were very, very concerned. I can remember when we were sort of putting a show together to make sure that everybody's material was included in some sort of equal amount, and that when casting was done, we decided who was going to do what, what part. There was a sort of balance to it all. It didn't always work out, but that's that's what we that's what we tried to do. The sketch that I'm constantly using this is. My example of what I thought was great about Python was the Undertaker sketch where John comes into an Undertaker's office with a bag. The bag is containing his dead mother, and he's trying to find out the best way of disposing of her. In theory, to me, you should be able to laugh at anything. There's no limits to what you should be able to laugh at. And I thought that was a, a sketch that actually proved that point. Because I remember when it was read out, it was in Terry's backyard, and I, I mean, it just collapsed. I couldn't believe anything could be that awful and that funny at the same time. And the fact that we did it was great. And there it stands as the real, as a, the real uh, apex of bad taste and humor, I think. I don't think anything, I can't imagine anything worse than that. <laughs> I'm's company. It's the instant Monty Python CD collection. Six compact discs in a deluxe box set. Complete with Lumberjacks, Spam, Fade Australian Wines, Thomas Hardy, Dead Parrots, Spanish Inquisitions and Elk, Cheese Shops, Mount Saitong, and lots of massages from the Swedish Prime Minister. In stores everywhere, or order by phone, toll free. Hi, I'm Mark Marin, and we here at Comedy Central want to make sure you start out the new year right, and what better way than with a 35-hour Monty Pythonathon? Now, 
What I should just put this down. One of the biggest landmarks for Monty Python was the release of their film Monty Python and the Holy Grail in 1975. The movie was made for less than $400,000 and it was co-directed by the twin Terrys, Jones and Gilliam. $400,000. How'd they do that? Well, the usual way, by substituting coconuts for horses. Let's watch. Watch. Sheep's bladders can be employed to prevent earthquakes. And we also know that sheep's intestines can be employed to prevent disease. The Holy Grail is one of those movies where just a few phrases conjure up memories of hilarious scenes, like, uh, it's only a flesh wound, or that's no ordinary rabbit. And a yell you still hear in New York City. Run away! Don't go anywhere. We've got another episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus coming up after these messages. So many sketches got written by using Roger's thesaurus, you know, just listing things. Or you get, I mean, when you actually think of the amount of Python time on the air that's spent just listing things, you know, whether it be cheese shops, whether it's the name of uh, parrots or rivers, um, using, you know, as the dead parrot, it's just you go to Roche's thesaurus, find as many phrases to describe death as possible. And there was one thing which we weren't allowed to do, which I was desperate to do, is we, a sketch would be going on. And what we were going to do in the course of the sketch, we would slowly turn the volume down on, on the mics so it get quieter and quieter and do it, so you time it so that people would have enough time to notice it's gone down and reach over to their sets and begin to turn the volume up and we turn it down and they turn it up and down, down until it reached a point where they're at max and then we were going to go, BAM! with the loudest noise we could do and blow up every set in the, in, in the country. But the BBC technicians wouldn't let us do that, but it would have been wonderful. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Marin, and here's a phrase I bet you haven't heard recently. Happy New Year! How about this one? Hey, quit leaning on me. Get it. You're drunk! Forget about that new Beatles BBC album. Comedy Central got hold of two long-lost episodes of Monty Python that were made originally for German television. Actually, the Germans have great taste when it comes to British imports, the Beatles and Monty Python. These two episodes, long sought after by Python fans, are having their U.S. television premiere right here on Comedy Central on New Year's Day and January 2nd at 10 p.m. Here's a peek. Whilst the mouse herds try... That was Chicken Mining from Monty Python, the last German episodes broadcast for the first time in America tonight and tomorrow night at 10 o'clock on Comedy Central. Python taped two episodes for German TV. The first one was uh, shot, if you can believe it, with the cast speaking entirely in German. And the second was done in English, but was later dubbed into German. Uh, we'll be back with another episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus right after these messages, which are in English. You're watching the Pythonathon. Here we are. Yandela Vasa, Gladenwi Stravenka. Here at Comedy Central. The, the important thing to remember was that we were sort of anti all sorts of conventional television forms. We, we just didn't want to get tied up with any of them. And that includes parody. I mean, I suppose Python could have been one long parody of television shows, but we didn't want to do that either. We did little parodies of television shows. We did quiz shows and, and lots of game show hosts were Python characters. But then we'd get bored with them after about a minute and a half and we'd go off and, uh, you know, have uh, get some Vikings or something, eating Spam or something like that. But I can tell you that um, something like Silly Walks was, was interesting because we, uh, Terry and I had brought in our material and in it we had this little idea that there should be a ministry for, um, uh, a ministry of silly thoughts or a ministry of brown things. Something like that. We just had the, we, we'd never worked into a sketch. We couldn't get it anywhere. As I remember, Graham Chapman sort of wrote this down, took it away and came back with an idea for a, something called the Ministry of Silly Walks. That took it one stage further. Still hadn't got it into a sketch form. And then Terry Jones and I took it back again and wrote the whole thing about someone appealing for a grant to do a silly walk. <laughs> tuned for more Monty Python here at Comedy Central. Happy New Year. Stay put for another episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus. But first, 
Here's a special little musical treat for all of you whose families were too cheap to buy you the new Beatles CD for Christmas. The Ruddles. Now yesterday and today are... There was something there which worked at the time. It's rather nice that it is still funny now. But the great thing was that it had no pattern. It had no organization. We were not working to some uh, program planners or some uh, big producers scheme. Absolutely the opposite. It really was as near as possible a free attempt to put the, you know, the humor of the six people uh, before the public. Hi, I'm Mark Marin, and let me ask you a question. How many times do you get presents for New Year's Day? Very rarely. Am I right? Well, here's the present. A two-day Monty Pythonathon right here at Comedy Central. Another question. Do you know which member of the Pythoners is American? Of course you do, and if you don't, it's Terry Gilliam, who worked behind the scenes on the television show to create those amazing signature Python animation sequences. After Python, Terry went on to write and direct films, including Time Bandits, Brazil, and The Fisher King, and of course, before all the big budget films, it was cut and paste time. In London. You know what I just realized? That even animated eyeballs make me a little squeamish. Coming up after these messages, some TV that's very good for your eyes. Another episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus. It seems to be more popular now than it ever was then when it went out. I mean, whenever we put out a new series, everybody would say, oh, well, of course, it's not as good as the old se last series. Um, and whenever we put out a film, like, they'd always say, well, it wasn't good. They, when The Holy Grail came out, everybody said, well, it's not as good as the TV shows. And when Life of Brian came out, everybody said, well, it's not as good as The Holy Grail. <laughs> you know? it, I mean, it was always that, you know, sort of somehow, there's something about comedy is that it's always better in retrospect. I don't know, I don't know why. <laughs> There was another show that came up that Eric was on. They got me on as a cartoonist. And uh, they had some material they didn't know how to present. And it was about, it was, it was material that was recorded over a period of about three months of a dis, particular disc jockey who used incredibly awful puns to link the records. And they didn't know what to do with just these punning links. And I said, let me make an animated film. And they just assumed I knew how to do these things, and I didn't. But I had two weeks and, they, were two weeks and 400 pounds to do it. And um, the only way I could do it was with cutouts. So I cut out, and the first time anybody had seen stuff, stuff like that on television, so I became an animator, and then out of that, we started working as a group. Hi, I'm Mark Marin, and it's a new year, 1995, right? Uh, we're celebrating by showing you pretty much all the Monty Python there is to show. It's our Pythonathon, and you should keep your eyes peeled for some of the group's recurring characters, like, of course, the man in the dinner jacket who says, and now for something completely different at the beginning of each show, or Graham Chapman's indignant army colonel who interrupts sketches he finds offensive, or perhaps the most famous of all, the Gumbies. Now, from what I understand, John Cleese invented the Gumby character, but it was really Michael Palin who really perfected it and made it his own. It seemed to fit in with the kind of salt-of-the-earth characters he was fond of creating. Now, I want to ask you something, or tell you something. Don't be a Gumby. Stick around for these messages, because we'll be right back with another episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus. I think with Python, we, went, we all went into it, six of us went into it on the understanding that we were all equals and uh, that everybody's voice was equal within the group and uh, that was a very clear, I mean it was a very deliberate policy that in fact we didn't put up our faces with our names or anything like that, we were kind of anonymous within the group, the whole idea was to achieve a sort of homogeneity if you like. Um, and it was like that, and I think that's what gave it a sort of um, a creative tension in a way, that we all, we all fought for our things, nobody, nobody was telling us what to do, it was what the six of us wanted to do, and so uh, in the end what Python was, was what six guys found funny. And, uh... <laughs> Happy, joyous, bountiful New Year. We are up to our next in the Monty Pythonathon here at Comedy Central, and now here's the gift of music from the Ruddles. If you've ever seen the Beatles movie A Hard Day's Night, then then you'll love I Must Be In Love. I think it was, always, it was interesting about Python, is they always thought we were druggies, major druggies. They couldn't believe we were into uh, LSD fans and, 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 and potheads, and we weren't. That's what was really strange about Python. We were incredibly straight, and all that stuff just came from whatever natural chemical imbalances we all had inside of us. <laughs>
we sat around for m- m- ages and ages when we should have been writing scripts. We sat around trying to think of a name for the show. Um, the first scripts we've got, uh, I think the first one we've got is called Wither Canada, Owl Stretching Time, Horse, a Spoon and a Basin was a favourite of mine, The Toad Elevating Moment, Bun, Whack it, Buzzard, Stubble and Boot. I think eventually John said, how about something slippery like a slime, like a python? And, and then Eric, I think, said something, oh yeah, what about sort of a, you know, sort of a, a seedy uh, stage um, agent, you know, uh, impresario, like uh, sort of Monty. And we all said, Monty Python's, Monty Python's flying circle. That's it. And we all just suddenly knew, absolutely then, there was no question we'd actually got it after all those months of, of dickering around. And I can remember rushing home and telling my brother, we've really got it, we're going to call it Monty Python's flying circus. And he said, oh, that'll never work. <laughs> I don't, I don't think collaborations should ever be smooth. I mean, the idea of smooth running is usually the sign that there's no life in the stuff. The thing that held it together was that chose, nobody chose us. You know, we weren't the, the producers didn't say, let's get these guys together. We chose to work with each other. We all had great respect for each other. That doesn't mean we agreed all the time. There were huge fights. It was terrifying. Because once you're in there fighting for your own material and somebody says it's a piece of crap, you know, you take umbrage. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Marin, sporting a Nehru jacket, and we here at Comedy Central are doing the best possible thing we could do to welcome in the new year. We're doing a Monty Python-a-thon. And let's talk John Cleese for a second. Not only was he the tallest python and the oldest python, he was also the only python whose original family name was Cheese. I'm not kidding. John left the group after the third season, but joined them for their stage shows and films. Michael Palin said John was the best in the group at playing humorless, middle-class bureaucrats, like the guy in the famous argument sketch and many other sketches. And I always think that, of, uh, that John Cleese was the best physical comedian in the group. He was, after all, the minister of silly walks. And here we see him as the rangy Ken Clean Air System, a boxer about to meet a tough opponent. Here's another interesting John Cleese fact. Besides his film career and movies like A Fish Called Wanda, he's also made a pile of money with a company he owns that makes funny industrial training films for businesses. How do you like that? Check out more Monty Python after these messages. The great thing about the group was that people, that people really did have different attitudes towards things. And that's really healthy, so there was always this tension. And, and what came out of it was a lot of times, the early sketches, you could almost tell who had written them. But as it went on, people learned from each other and started incorporating certain things that you know, Mike and Terry might incorporate things that John and Graham would normally have done. And, and it was this constant pulling and shoving and twisting. And I do something in the animation and suddenly find out one of the sketches would start having animation qualities or I would steal things from what they were doing and try to incorporate it into animation. So it was constantly just <coughs> like all of us in a big bag struggling. At the end of it, you'd open the bag and there'd be a show there. And the great joy of doing Python was that everything was done pretty fast because we didn't have much time and we had to shoot in one day, um, you know, film for three or four sketches. We had to film lots of quickies. We had to film lots of vox pops in the street. We had to dress up as Vikings one minute and, and housewives the next. You know, that was, that was quite exciting. Still, one of the things I admire most about the group, that we said, let's call it a day, rather than just carrying on and clinging on for dear life and making as much money as we can. Hi, I'm Mark Marin, and we're starting off the new year right with a Monty Python-a-thon. What can I say about Terry Jones, the man, that isn't eclipsed by Terry Jones, the woman, in countless Python sketches? The most amazing thing about his female characters is they predated Margaret Thatcher by eight years. Ah, uh, but did you know that Mr. Jones was also a brilliant concert pianist? Take my word for it, that's Terry playing the piano in this clip. Let's watch. To play Tchaikovsky. That was Terry Jones and Eric Idle as his beautiful assistant, and we will be right back with another episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus coming up after these messages. I think the Python view of the world is, in a sense, quite childlike. I don't mean childish, but childlike, in the sense that it's, it's hopefully it's very questioning. Um, but I think it's just that, that, that childlike questioning, that love of adventure, that sort of feeling that you know, does this have to be all there is? You know, surely there can be something else, you know. Uh, surely you can invent things here and there. And Python was, was inventive in the way children were inventive, too. Hi, I'm Mark Marin, and I want to wish you a very happy new year. And as a token of our goodwill toward man, we're doing a Monty Python-a-thon. 
Let's focus for a second on the wonderful Eric Idle. This guy could talk, that's for sure. Whether it was the nudge, nudge, wink, wink guy or Mr. Smoke Too Much in the travel agency sketch. And I think, personally, my thoughts. He was best at playing newsmen, announcers, and hosts. Right here we have Eric as the host of Storage Jars, a urgently compelling new BBC series. <laughs> Eric Idle was also responsible for one of my favorite post-Python productions, his Beatles parody called The Ruddles. If you haven't heard about it, you should hear about it now with songs by Neil Innes. We'll be checking out a lot of them as our Pythonathon continues. And we'll be back with another classic episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus after these messages. So, so really, by the time I was about to leave Oxford, I wasn't really going to be historian. And the odd thing was that about five years later, when we began to do Python, a lot of this sort of ragbag of education came up in Python sketches. I mean, I didn't know a lot about the Spanish Inquisition, <laughs> but I knew enough to write a sketch about uh, the Spanish Inquisition coming in. Nobody! Hi, how are you? Happy New Year to you. I hope you didn't drink too much and you're not sitting at home with puke all over your shirt. Anyways, we're celebrating one institution, New Year's, with the comedy institution Monty Python. One of the most popular members of the group has always been Michael Palin, an Oxford man who wrote many of the Python sketches with his old school chum, Terry Jones. By the way, to enhance your enjoyment of this Michael Palin clip, keep in mind that one pound equals about a dollar sixty U.S. currency. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Blackmail. That is by far the most frightening piano player I've seen since Elton John. You know who it was? It was Terry Gilliam. I'm not kidding around here, folks. Stick around for another episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus coming up after these messages. Because Python were not six people working absolutely in sync at all. I mean, the fact that we were slightly out of sync, I think, gave Python the strength and the quality that made it work. You know, it was like a sort of centrifugal force. While it was controlled, it was terribly strong and produced material very, very fast. And then whizzes all went spinning off and, uh, you know, that, that was the end. It's remarkable that I think we could all sit round a dinner table um, and, and still <laughs> enjoy at least one course together. Hi, I'm Mark Marin, and we are ringing in the new year here at Comedy Central with the Monty Pythonathon. One of the favorite settings for the group was the courtroom, like the outdoor rich trial that King Arthur presided over in the Holy Grail or the trial of Cardinal Richelieu in the modern British court. Maybe they like courtrooms because John Cleese studied law at Cambridge. Or maybe my writer was just looking for another fact that I could share with you. Anyway, this next clip was a lot of, uh, has a lot of great Python elements in addition to the courtroom setting. Cleese is a stuffy barrister. Graham Chapman plays his trademark police constable. There's a Hungarian phrase book at issue. And best of all, we even get a cutaway shot of the elderly women clapping. Enjoy. On the 28th. My favorite courtroom sketches from Python had Eric Idle as a guy who had killed 20 people one morning, but he was such a polite defendant that the courtroom ended up singing for He's a Jolly Good Fellow to him. You know what I'm talking about? Well, look for that sketch somewhere, sometime in our mind. Happy New Year from me, Mark Marin at Comedy Central. We, of course, have more Monty Python episodes in a minute, but first, here's a song left off the Ruddles album because lawyers felt it sounded too much like the Beatles. Uh, the song Get Back, actually. Oh, man, maybe we're going to get sued. Do you think we are? In the midst of all... Well, I, I see them all. I, I mean, I'm sort of a bit of man in the middle, because I think perhaps I, I... I've known Terry, obviously, Terry Jones, for an awful long time, so we're just good friends anyway. We play games of squash together, and we, we go out for dinner a lot. Terry Gilliam, I, I live near... Uh, he lives nearby. I see him quite a lot. Eric is in America at the moment, but when he's over here, we, we meet up. Um, and John Cleese is hopefully writing a film with a part for me next year, so I see him. I think that's a lot of them, really. Graham, I would like to see more of. I sometimes would. I'm rather hoping that he will sort of manifest himself at one time in some outrageous way, because I miss him a lot. Shut your festering gob, you tit! 